Hey everyone, and welcome to another episode of Don't Open That Door. As always, I'm your host, Justin, and I'm joined by Dan. Dan, how you doing? Doing pretty good today. Pretty good, pretty good. Pretty good. All right. And we're also joined by the ever lovable Nico. Nico, how you doing? Oh, I didn't know I was ever lovable. I'm doing just fine. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. That was a typo. It's never lovable. And today wow. we're going to be Today we're going to be discussing Howl. Released in 2015, this is a British kind of independent horror directed by Paul Hiet, written by Mark Huckerby and Nick Osler. This stars Ed Spielers as the main character, Holly Weston, Elliot Cohen, Amit Shah, Shauna McDonald, Rosie Day, and Duncan Preston. So our story essentially takes place, we open with Joe, who is, he's a train guard. I think here in the States, we would refer to them more as like a, what, like a, like a train usher, like he collects your tickets, right? Yeah. I, I guess, yeah. So he's got a little bit of a, a little bit of a puppy crush on Ellen, who's another coworker on the train. But you know, he's trying to impress her a little bit, try to get a promotion, but he gets passed over for it, and she doesn't really return his affections. So as he gets off of one of his shifts, uh, his brand new supervisor, who actually beat him to the position, tells him that he's got to work on another shift. It's a real late red eye train uh, leaving London, taking them out, you know, into the sticks. So he gets on along with Ellen and some passengers that we've got here. There's a kind of studious Indian guy who goes by the name of Matthew. Uh, Nina, who's kind of a younger, annoying, kind of more party girl. Billy, who's a young, kind of strapped lad. We have Adrian, a businessman. Kate, a businesswoman. Jed and Jenny, an old couple. And Paul, a slightly overweight football slash soccer fan. So all these guys are on the train. He's collecting their tickets when, bloop, their train hits a deer. Now, unfortunately, this ruptures their fuel line, causes the fuel pressure to drop, and the train stops. The conductor goes out, and that's when this movie really takes off. A whole pack of werewolves just attack. They murder the they murder the conductor, and the rest of the you know the people on the train. At first, they're a little bit annoyed. Oh, how could this train stop? But after a while, you know the werewolves start to attack, and people start to die. First world problems, right? I know it's just a werewolf attack. My trains stop all the time. Mine do too. <laughs> <laughs> I have a car, so. So basically the werewolves start to attack and they hatch a plan. So Billy and Matthew, they decide to go outside to kind of fix the fuel leakage. They manage to do so successfully, but Matthew ends up getting killed. And one of the women on the train as well, Jenny, she gets bitten and she starts to change. Things just kind of go awry and everybody on the train ends up getting killed with the exception of Adrian joe and ellen his love interest you know adrian we kind of don't see what happens to him joe and ellen run away and then at the last second you know joe kind of realizes they both can't get away so he sacrifices himself so ellen can escape oh and ellen does make it out and afterwards we do get to see that joe now a werewolf ends up murdering the living shit out of adrian so yeah that's pretty much how the movie ends i wouldn't call it a happy ending but it was definitely an ending so yeah, I guess first, just really quickly, kind of yes or no. Uh, Nico, you like this movie? Was it all right? Oh my God, I absolutely loved it. It was fantastic and took me by surprise. Dan? I thought it was pretty good. I, I wouldn't go quite as far as Nico, but I had a great time watching the movie and I wasn't sure what to expect when you recommended it. I thought it could be a really, really Likewise. bad like B-horror movie, like the, the good kind of bad horror movie. And I was actually thought it was a pretty good movie. What do you think? Yeah, I, I definitely agree. Considering the budget that this movie was under, I thought for sure that it was a, definitely a good movie. Definitely a good movie. So I guess to start with, you know, looking at the visuals and audio, this movie came out in 2015. So definitely something that is still on the more recent side, I'd say. So what, in, taking that into account, what do you guys think about the, you know, the costumes, the visuals? How, how did that look to you? Start with you, Dan. What do you feel about that? I actually thought it was pretty good. And and again, kind of going back to the, the thing where I, I thought that it was like a B movie in the opening scene when they're in the train station and it's at nighttime or I think it's about nighttime, evening maybe. Yeah, midnight. Like it's night, dead it's on. night, it's night. Yeah, and and just like the colors of the, the video and the quality of the video. I was actually taken by surprise because again, I thought it was like a, a low budget, not good movie. Same here. But I mean, overall, like I thought... Nothing really stood out to me for for the the film other than just 
being more than what I expected. But music wise, nothing stood out. The only thing about that for me was there's one scene where Joe, the main character, opens one of the doors and they use a like a very, very common stock like door open sound. And I was uh, like, yeah. no, why did you do that? But other than that, I was like, all right, whatever. You know, it's it's just pretty, pretty standard quality and film quality and, and music, I guess. True. Nico, how'd you feel about the uh, werewolf costume designs? Honestly, I was really impressed. They they did look a little silly insofar as they were just fucking diesel levels of stacks. Like, we're talking power lifter werewolves, not like the skinny, gaunt, skeletal werewolves that you're used to. This is a werewolf that could bench press a truck and smile while doing it. But having said that, I thought that they were really decently done really decently done like really scary i gotta say so i will actually say this howell was actually director paul hyatt's it wasn't his first uh foray into the horror genre he actually um had a movie which is one of my favorite werewolf movies dog soldiers um came out in 2002 he was the special effects creature prosthetic and makeup designer for that movie so he already had experience creating werewolves I thought you meant he was the creature <laughs> no 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 he, no, was, no he was actually the werewolf he was yeah. the guy yeah and this guy's really awesome because he also has worked on the effects for attack the block which is another movie Wait, that for I think real that we'll end up watching at some point yeah he also worked on effects for the woman in black so this guy oh been that's around. wild yeah this huh. guy has been around and he's done a lot of really great work that's really impressive so, i gotta say I personally also was a big fan of how everything looked. In terms of the sound, there was one moment that really kind of stood out to me. It's when they were on the front of the train um, after they restore the oil pressure, fix the fuel leakage, and they kind of get the train going again. There's a moment where you know they're they're happy, everything's fine, and then the train loses fuel pressure again because it's a dodgy fix, Billy. Got some duct tape on there and it just came off. Yeah, Billy. Billy um ends up accidentally com- uh, ripping off a piece of the tape when he's gripping on and the train stops and then they play this kind of bass heavy kind of sound and it sounds like a heartbeat. It's like, doo-doo, doo-doo. and it's like, oh, snap. Like, I thought that was really badass. So I was I was a pretty big fan. I was actually a pretty big fan of it. Um, Going into our next kind of, you know, category, our very own Nico had something to say about the genre. Nico, why don't you go ahead and speak on it, sir? So, like I was saying earlier, this movie definitely took me by surprise. Like Dan was saying, I did not know what to expect at all going into this. I figured it would be definitely a B movie at best because I hadn't heard anything about this that I was expecting it just to be a werewolf movie because, you know, howl. But I... I honestly think this could be construed or understood, at least in some scenes, as a bit of a comedy, horror comedy, of course, not like something that you would see starring Adam Sandler or anything. But I think that it is, it's one of those movies where, or rather one of those horror movies where people actually do a lot of stuff right, I think, and we'll get into that later. But they they do a lot of things right, and they really take care of some of these werewolves and actually make some genuinely smart decisions. And so seeing that just got the shock value out of me. I just started laughing with surprise at some of it, not because of any real setup, not that there was any you know delivery that was particularly clever or funny, but just because... In horror movies, you don't expect people to act intelligently, and then when they do, and they do so in droves in some parts, it just, I I don't know, it it got a nice little chuckle out of me. I will say that I have to disagree a little bit with the comedy kind of characterization. I think any movie can have, you know, some scenes that might evoke a little bit of a comedic response without necessarily being a comedy. You know, it's like, it's like you might rap, but you ain't a rapper. So oh. to the same to the same extent, I think the scenes with there's a uh, kind of a overweight passenger, Paul, who's constantly depicted as either eating or having to take a shit. He ends up getting killed whilst taking a shit for the second time in a row. That was the second time in a row <laughs> taking a shit, not second time in a row getting killed. <laughs> <laughs> that would make it a definite comedy. So, I would watch that movie. <laughs> he gets uh, he gets killed in the bathroom by a werewolf. And 
you know, that is kind of funny. It's kind of funny. The fact that he's taking a shit and gets trapped in the toilet for a second time. That is comedy in a way because he gets trapped again at the start of the movie, which is kind of foreshadowing that, hey, you probably shouldn't be locking this door. It's pretty shitty. Yeah, it is pretty shitty. You're right about that. Oh. But I don't know. I would consider this to be a pretty straight through and through horror. Dan, thoughts? I, I would say it's straight horror. There, I, I agree with you, Justin. There are definitely comedy parts, especially I feel like near the beginning when we're sort of being introduced to all the different characters, different people on the train. Uh, a lot of their character traits are a little bit exaggerated. Absolutely. One girl, what's her name? Nina, the the party girl kind of thing. Yeah. You know, she she's very exaggerated in her, I'm talking on the phone and just uh, at one point, the main character, Joe, asked her for her ticket and she's like completely ignores him talking to her friend on the phone and purposely ignores him. And then when she finally talks to him, she tells her friend, oh my God, he's staring at my breasts, which obviously he's not. So some of the characters are a little like over the top sometimes. But once I feel like once it actually gets into the movie, the meat of the movie, they're they're not quite over the top anymore. So I would say definitely some slightly comedic parts, but I wouldn't go quite as far as to say it's horror comedy. Well, one of the things, and you hit on a point that I was going to bring up later, I think the reason why they're kind of caricatures almost is there's not a lot of time to introduce these characters. Mm -hmm. So they made them they made them characters that we kind of already know, you know, who doesn't know like a sleazy businessman who doesn't know like someone who, you know, is a little bit of like a coward. And that's, that's one thing I did want to talk about. In my opinion, the main character, Joe, um, I think he's at the start of the movie. I think he is a little bit of a coward. I think, (sighs) and I think they kind of go out of their way to show him as uh, for example, there's a scene when the train first kind of stops he tries to help out the girl he likes, Ellen, by picking up her cart, but he's actually not strong enough to do so. And again, when the pass, he lets the passengers basically, you know, take the piss and do whatever. Like he lets them run amok. He doesn't have a very, you know, commanding or imposing tone. But later on in the movie, he starts to grow a pair. But go ahead, Nico, tell me. You sounded like you didn't agree with me there. Which is uh, that's that's because I, I don't see. Like I never took him as a coward. I took him as a guy who was just literally not paid enough for this shit. He got pass up her in a pr- promotion. He's dealing with really shitty people all over the place. One of the scenes that they spend, I think, the most time on with the beginning here with the intro, where he's going around doing his duties and getting the tickets is like you were saying when he was going in and talking to Nina and trying to get her ticket. And they spend a lot of time showing that, like there's camera pans over to signs saying like, hey, this is a quiet car. Hey, this is a no smoking zone. Hey, please don't be, you know, just annoying. And Nina checks off all three. She's on her phone, on speakerphone, listening to music, smoking a cigarette. These old, this old couple across from her is just giving her the death eyes. And... Joe is very clearly both literally tired because it is near the witching hour and it is, you know, we can see some sort of existential dread in him. And in that, I can relate to him. You know, I don't think he's a coward. I think he's just exhausted. I pretty much agree with Nico. I I don't think he was really a coward. I almost feel like he was a normal person. Agreed. And most other people on the train were either assholes or like that businessman, masculinity plays sort of a part in this movie, I think. But, and you had mentioned, you know, sort of the, you know, how at the beginning, Joe, you know, in your opinion, is a little coward, but by then he's not. I actually think he's pretty normal, but the business guy over exaggerates masculinity. For sure. And, and really like, because I mean, at one point in the movie, he even comes out and says like, oh, you got to like man up and you got to, you know, whatever, whatever. But I don't think that Joe ever really wasn't like masculine, quote unquote, or whatever. Definitely agreed. I think he was just acting like most people would act. And then near the end, when when he was sort of a little bit more brave, I think that's just a natural progression of, well, everyone, I think, kind of got a little bit more brave once. once Brave or dead. Know, werewolves. Yeah, right. So, yeah, that's my thought on that. I will say it's interesting. So we were going to go into masculinity next. And I think that's an interesting point you make. But I think actually, you know, the character of Adrian, who's the kind of sleazy businessman who, as you say, over projects masculinity. I think he's actually an example of shallow masculinity, 
So when there's no chips down on the table, he's completely fine with helping people out. He's completely fine with being the perfect gentleman. He's completely fine with, you know, being the guy that everybody wants to be. Very congenial. Yeah, but it's it's skin deep. It's very shallow. He's not actually a good person because when shit goes down, there's a couple things. First off, there's a scene where they try to escape the train, all the passengers, and you know, he leads the charge. However, when it comes when they get ambushed by werewolves and they all run back to the train, he makes sure that he's the first person on the train. He makes sure he's the first guy on the train. Then there's a scene where uh, Paul's taking a shit and Joe goes to go save him. <laughs> and Adrian just sits back and waits. You know? I mean, do you need more than one person to check on that? Like, I, I do not like the character and I will not go to bat for this guy. But do you really need more than one person to knock on the door and be like, hey, yo, Tubby, you good? Well, it's because they knew there was a werewolf there. They knew there was a werewolf going to get him, so he he needed backup. And they ended up Eh, I guess that's fair. And again, he ended up going after, you know, um one of the businesswomen, what's her name? Kate. She actually convinced him by staring and he was like, Oh shit, I guess I gotta go. So he's not actually concerned with masculinity. I think he's concerned with the pretense of masculinity. And I think the example, particularly of British masculinity in this movie, that we kind of have to look at is the uh the old guy this film is, is british jed. for context yeah it's a british film uh his name is jed and he kind of espouses that old school like world war ii fashion like british stoicness resilience because there's a scene where after they run back onto the train they're that they now know for certain they're being bombarded by werewolves they don't know what to do you know he gives them a speech he's like listen we can sit here and fight or we can do something about it and it's very like very woodrow wilson-esque very Woodrow Wilson. Ha. That's the wrong name to shout out here. Oh my God. But- I meant Winston Churchill. <laughs> <laughs> Very good, sir. I didn't and fail history lost- class, I promise. We've lost all our British uh, supporters of that one. But no, I was surprised because that was a very rousing speech and he kind of gets everyone up and at arms. And he's kind of the representation of old school masculinity and the good parts. And I think Joe, by the end of it, he really is like, he he grows to the occasion. I think he's he's the kind of guy who rises to the occasion, which I did appreciate. He's a grower, not a shower. Yeah, I think he definitely he definitely rises to the occasion. I don't know personally. I wouldn't say that it's a ton of character development through for him, but I think for that Adrian he, or Joe for Joe. Ah. I, I think that like yes, he does rise to the occasion and get a little bit more brave, but I don't think it's it's quite as much as the movie wanted me to think. Definitely oh, agreed. It's not like a, it's not like a <laughs> it's not like a literary classic or anything. This is something where I think the characters are growing because of the insane environment that they're in, as opposed to a genuine character arc. Like we don't see any backstory where, like previously on Hal, we had Joe really struggling with his own identity and coming to terms with his taking initiative and standing up for himself. No, it's just he's just kind of like there it's it's his job and he even says or not he says but his love interest alan says you know you ever uh consider getting a new job <laughs> and he you know kind of begrudgingly says uh yeah after tonight i'm pretty sure i will but i, I don't really think it's so much uh you know joseph campbell hero of a thousand faces kind of thing so much as it is just like they're having a real bad time with it man <laughs> yeah no definitely definitely so i gotta ask let's say uh you know there's an extra passenger on that train and it's you uh what would you do in that scenario starting with you dan would you what would you do see that's tough because like nico mentioned before i feel like this was one of those movies where everyone pretty much did logical things for the most part um what would i do i can give you a buffer there if you need it because i know what i would do all right, go, go ahead. Tap, what would you tap, do? Tap in. So I did mention that this is a movie where people do the right thing for the most part in terms of like logic, not ethics. But I will say in the first third of the movie, when they stop the train or rather when the train is stopped by that deer. And can I just say I find it very unrealistic that running over a deer would cause a train to stop. But that aside, um, 
when they all get off the train and go out to like look around and start walking back to the station, which they even note is only about two miles away from where they are. Why would they go and abandon the track and start wandering through the forest? That was the dumbest shit. And it happens like twice. I don't get it. Mm -hmm. Once as a group and once when Matt is trying to either be heroic or homicidal, which we'll get to later. I I just don't understand. They had a path that was clearly laid out for them. They could have just followed it back and, you know ran with a quickness and they probably would have been fine like maybe they would have lost a couple members of their party but i, I think they would they, have been fine a couple people dead but they would have been i, I fine. mean like the the older couple definitely would have gotten eaten but you know it the cards were not in it for them regardless i think um i i just i don't under it i cannot fathom the brain processes the thought processes that made them think oh yeah let's go wandering into the woods like no. So, you know what's interesting? First off, I agree with you mostly. The only kind of defense I can raise for them is they probably wanted, because the tracks are completely clear, so the werewolves can see them. I guess in the woods, they maybe have a little more tree cover. I guess. But again, I agree with you, though. I they could have gone would've... parallel to it then instead of perpendicular. <laughs> no, I mean, you're absolutely right, for sure, for sure, for sure, sure. I guess from my perspective, I would have stuck together more Mm -hmm. for example when they sent matt and billy out there to go fix the fuel i would have also sent adrian and joe out there because you saw what happened when just like two people were out there because i guarantee if so there's a scene where billy is underneath the train kind of fixing the fuselage and matt hears a voice so he leaves Billy by himself and goes into the woods to try and help the voice who turns out to be Nina. However, she's like ripped in half and being eaten and the werewolves end up killing Matt in the woods and that leaves Billy vulnerable. And that's partially how things get messed up because Billy has to do a quick repair on the fuselage then and he doesn't do it properly. So if there had been more people though, can you imagine that would be like if Matt, you know, hears a voice, help me. And then all of a sudden Adrian be like, mate, no. Don't do it. And that would have been the end of it. <laughs> yeah. Dan, what are that, your thoughts? That is that is one thing that I feel like for every horror movie, if I was ever in most of these situations, I would enact a buddy system where yep. nobody goes anywhere alone ever. Like you gotta take a shit, two of you are in that bathroom. Like <laughs> nobody is true. Going. you gotta take a shit, two of you are taking a shit. I mean, who well, knows? Yeah, I mean, yeah. <laughs> But, you know, that way no one's ever left alone. So in all these movies where there's like hallucinations, the other person would be like, nope, that's not real. Or like, <laughs> like, just, say, like, like just keep your, keep check, keep your person in check, you know? Just so, very matter of fact, nope, not real. Nope, nope, don't do that. Um, I totally agree <laughs> with you when, when Matt like went off to like check on Nina. I, I was like, no, bro, why would you do that? <laughs> like, that's not even, no, just don't. Like I don't a little even bit of context care if she's there alive. is that Matt is we think he is a nerdy guy and you know I would say he is one of the scenes in the beginning of the movie when the power goes off and they stop the tracks is Matt makes a um he, he says to Joe he's like oh no I lost my page on my textbook and I'm sorry for the mangling of the accent there but about 40 minutes later we see Matt go to town on the first werewolf and just murder this guy seven ways from Sunday with an axe and he even says after that he's like I I don't know what came over me there because it's one of those violent scenes in the movie the werewolf like barely so they down it first they um like Justin was saying there's a whole pack of them and the first one that gets on the train they managed to take care of it they managed to actually subdue it which was really hype and i was really enjoying it and then there is a little you know just a the tiniest of breaths the tiniest of 
coming from it. And then Matt just, I guess he has this inner dialogue of, oh, hell no, gets the axe and just performs 10 back-to-back critical hits to the face. And I, I don't know if he was just feeling mighty courageous there, partner, but he really shouldn't have taken that on on his own when he was trying to go and rescue Nina, which we, I think we already knew was a, a story and doomed to failure. Agreed. True. Definitely, definitely, definitely I agreed thought, there. I thought Matt was the one who killed the werewolf the first time, and then after the werewolf sort of like yeah, started to come back. But no, after he started to come back, Joe's the one who bashed its head in with a with a um a fire hydrant or um what's it? Oh well either the way he yeah, no, yeah. you are correct, but regardless, he does like Yeah, he, take he definitely a, goes in like a, it, it's a scene with an axe that I haven't seen since the shining. I will say, and that's you know, kind of going on to our favorite scenes. I think that's 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 one that none of us can pick because that was one that was definitely probably all of us one yeah. of our favorite scenes. So, as Nico is saying, uh, one of the werewolves. This is the first time the werewolf manages to make it onto the train, and it jumps into the room and it's like, "What's up?" It doesn't say that, but it's like, Ugh. <laughs> "God, I and wish." Then, <laughs> and I then, will say though, these werewolves are like actually smart. Because like once yeah. or twice, that werewolf like opens the door. Like it doesn't like knock the door down. It like opens the door. Yeah. Well. Oh yes, I have thumbs. <laughs> that's what I was. So this leads into a theory that I'm going to bring up later towards the end. But so the werewolf walks in, is like grr, and everyone's like, "It's time for a team up attack." And then they just all like <laughs> stomp the shit out of the werewolf. Like the werewolf <laughs> doesn't even amazing. have a chance. <laughs> I was like, you know what? You guys should just do that. You guys should just yeah. like wait mm-hmm. for them. But then the werewolves kind of wise up. Um, and Nina, the character who we said dies, she dies as she gets a phone call, goes backs up towards the window, and then one of the werewolves kind of yanks her out of the window. And at that point in time, that's when they start kind of barricading the train so the werewolves can't get in. But again, yeah, good decision. Yeah, that was a good decision. Um, but I don't know. It was it was definitely interesting. Uh besides that, were there any scenes that you really took to, Dan? Anything you liked? Um Nothing else that really jumped out at me, to be honest with huh. you. Interesting, interesting. Nika, how about you? Oh yeah, my my favorite scene, except for the like stomp him out section, was when Nina died. I could not stand her. I was so glad to see oh, her yeah. go. This was one of the thing. This is one of those movies, um, dear listeners, where I was texting Justin when I was watching this, and one of my first thoughts was, "Oh God, I hope everyone in this cast dies." And I almost got my wish. And one of the first ones to die was Nina, and just God, I was clapping. Yeah, she gets it pretty good, especially because she actually stays alive a long time with her guts and entrails hanging out. Yeah, pretty she's brutal. still somewhat alive when Matthew finds her like half an hour later. So she's yikes. hanging by a moment here with you. She's alive enough to be uh, screaming, help me, help me. Yeah, the werewolves kind of lucked out there. But my favorite scene is actually one that's it's a little bit comedic, Nico, to kind of your point about it being a little bit of a comedy earlier on. And despite what I said earlier, you know, Paul sitting there on the train kind of eating and there's a little conversation between Ellen and Joe and Joe asks Ellen, if you know, after this, if she wants to go out for a drink and you have, you know, Paul just sitting there kind of watching his eyes going back and forth between (laughs) the two of them. And then Ellen goes in perhaps what is the nicest put down I've ever seen. Oh, I don't, I don't think any places will be open. Which is true to his credit yeah. and her credit. I mean, I think so, but I, I, I really like afterwards, she's like, but you know, um, definitely try again. And he's like, no, nah, it was kind of spur of the moment. She was like, oh, I wasn't talking about this. And I was like, <laughs> aw, aw. <laughs> so I like that. That was, a little, that was a little funny thing. But no, I guess, and as, as kind of like a group, were there any scenes that you didn't like outside of Matt's uh, moment of madness? For me, not really. I'm not going to lie. There wasn't really too much else wrong, from my, from my opinion. I did. Uh, the one thing I thought that was a little cheesy was after near that right at the end when, um, when Joe and Ellen get off the train and they're running through the forest. Right. That reminded me of like an old throwback B horror movie. Oh, yeah. Like if, if the How's movie that? started like that, I don't know, just the way that the camera angles were and the, it to me, it just felt like that, like scene where they're just running away, just like got turned down in quality. 
I don't, That's I don't interesting. quite know how to explain that, but like everything else to me was the the lighting and everything was good and the I don't know. But that scene just really reminded me of like a a not great not bad, but just like not a great movie from twenty or thirty years ago, twenty years ago. I think I don't know. part of the reason for that might be because it's not at night and raining and dark anymore. So I was just a lot say of stuff. That. Yeah, a lot of stuff they'd be able to cover up. They couldn't really cover up. And I mean, when you see the werewolf costumes in broad daylight, they definitely don't look as good as they do in the rain, in the dark. Yes. I thought that was still at night, but I thought it was like... At the end, it was in the, like, after twilight? sunrise. Oh. I mean, I know yeah, Adrian's twilight sunrise-ish. Part. Well, I mean, I thought when Adrian died, that was, like, during the day. But I thought before that, when they got off the train, it was still night. I thought the it sun was, was starting like, to come up, though. The sun was definitely starting to come up, yeah. I thought it was just brighter because it was full moon and they were sort of in like a clearing area. But I, I guess I was wrong on that. But no, yeah, when, she, when Ellen's running away, it's like clearly lit. The path oh. that she's running mm-hmm. down. It's lit, fam. Mm-hmm. It's very lit. True, but, um, true. but no, that's okay. Okay. Nico, anything from your end? I mean, I don't know if I would call this a scene that I didn't like necessarily, but um, just something that I totally saw coming and wasn't happy to see when Adrian could have saved Kate, but instead kicked her off the train to yeah, he's save an himself. For that. Yeah, he's definitely an asshole for that. Like, I saw it coming. It didn't surprise me, but I was just like, oh, come on, buddy. Yeah, I definitely think that he's like one of the more, if there was a villainous human character, it would have been him. But I do think to a certain extent, he was very selfish. However, he also had the highest survival instinct. Yep. So sometimes they should have listened to him, like with uh, Jenny, and she was literally turning into a werewolf, and they were mm-hmm. still protecting her. I had a bin chopped her head Which off. Which was insane. Yep. yep. Like, Ged was saying, Jed, Ged, I don't remember, the, the husband, was saying, if you touch a nary head on my my wife's head, I'll break your neck. And then Adrian's like, lol, I don't think that'll actually happen, and just, like, tries <laughs> to end it right then and there. But everyone's like, no, there's still a chance, when clearly there is not. She was very well past the point of no return. Better accent that time, Nico. Th- thank you, thank you. I was actually kind of surprised when Adrian does not save ellen he sort of has a choice between potentially saving ellen or potentially saving jed and he kind of opts for jed which surprised me i thought he was going to save ellen and then like try to like kill jenny smash. The, who's in, oh, never who's in mind. Werewolf. and and yes also smash so i was actually kind of surprised <laughs> that he decided to not i don't know that uh, I thought that was a weird decision. I agree. I think it was really down to, he's very opportunistic. So I think when it came time to uh, kind of help Ellen out, was it Ellen or Jenny or not? Was it Ellen or Kate? The businesswoman. Oh, it was Kate, Kate was the Kate, business Sorry, woman. not, not Ellen. Right. Kate. Sorry. Yeah. Cause Kate was being snatched up by some werewolves. And I think at that point in time, she had already called him out because she recognized him as being kind of like a creep who would try and, you know, hire prospective women and then just, she interviewed him. with him. Yeah. So, that went, I think he knew that kind of like, oh, I've been outed here. And I think he felt not necessarily threatened, but I think he was like, nah, fuck you for that. And so he, mm. in her, in his head, you know, he, he kicked her out. And yeah, also in reality, he kicked her out. But I don't know. Nico, any thoughts on that? I mean, the, I, I do, unfortunately, insofar as what you said about the survival instinct. So little context for our dear listeners. I am probably not the healthiest of the three here, and I would definitely try to look out for, like, myself and my kin. So, like, I unfortunately feel a little bad for identifying with Adrian in that regard. Like, I, I would have been, like, tossed the Jenny off the train to be werewolf fodder a while ago. And I identified with the survivability instinct. So like I get that and I can appreciate that. But but yeah, no, I mean, the character development in regards to that was I I definitely appreciated it. And like you were saying with Ged's speech earlier where he was like rousing the troops, it was it was nice. It was nice. So and before we get to our uh, kind of final final section here, I did want to ask you guys a question. How intelligent do you think these werewolves are? Mm. I'd say they're pretty intelligent. I mean, yeah. Open door. They they open the door. I think 
I think <laughs> I think you've hit on something there. I didn't realize <laughs> I didn't realize that was like the Turing test for intelligence. Well, it wasn't. And then I was trying to think of something else smart they did, and I just just came up with opening a door. So, so no, I'm of the opinion that they put the deer on the tracks to uh, mess up a train. Now, my theory Ooh. is based on the fact that Ged slash Jed, the old old guy, he said, "You're too young to remember this, but back in 1968, something very <laughs> similar to this happened." And like he went on a little bit of a story about how like. There was a train, same situation, same area as well. A similar thing happened. A rescue crew came the next day and like everyone was like ripped to shreds. And they just never investigated further. So, I mean, <laughs> yeah, I have a feeling that the werewolves, I have a feeling that they kind of learned how to like stop trains or how to like do that kind of stuff. They also, took some team building exercises, definitely. Well, they probably did. I also think that they choose who they recruit into their pack. You think so? Hmm. I do. Because if you notice, Nina gets killed. They straight up kill and eat Nina. They sympathize with the Watcher, yeah. But Joe, keep in mind, Joe stands off, he squares off against three of them. He fights them. He stabs one of them. And then they actually don't hurt him too bad. They just bite him. They don't hurt him that bad. That's true, Because when we see him again later on, He's completely fine. He's a werewolf and he's completely fine. That's a good point. Yeah. So, so they both convert and turn people as well, uh, intentionally rather, as well as, God forbid, they open doors. No, definitely they do open those doors, which is why we always say not to do that. But, <laughs> open those doors. <laughs> you're right. I think my other kind of theory there is Billy, who was, you know, a badass and probably Billy was my favorite character in the movie. He, you know, comes back with like a lit torch and then they kind of run away from him. And at first I thought it was because they were kind of primal, like primal instinct afraid of fire, but that wasn't the case. They ran away so that they could ambush him because right afterwards we see oh, that they like, yeah. they grabbed him. So they're mm. very familiar with like tactics and like hunting things. They also, when they heard the cell phone immediately went for Nina. Yeah. I don't think they they were all that tactical in, in killing Billy. I uh, kill my point. I think they definitely <laughs> ran away from the fire because he threw two Molotov cocktails at them. And fair point there, Dan. And I think they ran away from that and then regrouped. Sure, but they were definitely running because he caught one of them on fire, so that one ran away. For a second, I thought you meant he caught the Molotov cocktail. Like, gotcha, bitch. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> Also, a note on Billy, he is easily the biggest badass of the cast. We touched on it earlier when he we were talking about how he was repairing the train, but Billy was the one who, he actually went outside and he went under the train, and he was not able to get out before the train started moving because there was a, there was a pack right next to him who could have seen him, and so he was hanging on for dear life to the undercarriage of the train for quite a while, and the audience doesn't know that he's still alive until boom, he shows up with Molotov cocktails, like say hello to my little friend, and it was a beautiful moment. I was I was cheering for him. No, I definitely agree. Billy was was great. Any other characters that stuck out as maybe some some fan favorites? No, Billy. He was also not an asshole. <laughs> like, <laughs> that is every, true. Yeah. Every other character at the beginning of the movie is an asshole to to Joe, the main character. And I thought a lot of people were very unfair to Joe. And like, man, particularly he's just, Kate. Yeah, like he's just fucking working there, man. It's his job to like. You don't have your ticket, like sorry, it's his job. Don't don't shoot the messenger, you know? Like I don't know. And everyone like people would just like look at him funny. I'm like, why? Why? Like he's just normal dude. Yeah. But but yeah, I thought Billy was was the least asshole of everybody, also badass and just all around good dude. So now, with an unfortunate glance, I have to tell you the scores of this movie on Rotten Tomatoes. Oh, no, so, I didn't look it up ahead of time. It's going to be low, I bet. So with critics, it's sitting at a relatively mediocre 64%. However, with audiences, it's sitting at a 37%. What? So 
What so, are they thinking? This movie's a blast. I got to ask first, we all definitely disagree with the 37%, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, oh, yeah, absolutely. All right, so let me ask you this. If you kind of, where would you see this on Rotten Tomatoes? What percentage? I would put it at like a 70, 75. No, maybe 75 to 80. Yeah, I would oh, say okay. That. Okay, 75 to 80% for Dan. Nico? So I don't know if Rotten Tomatoes does this since they're an aggregate, but uh, aggregator, I should say, but I would put it like keeping in mind the low budget and like there are no big names in this. So they were really like, they, they were milking what they had. I would put this at like an 80 to an 85 myself. Hmm. I personally... I, I would agree with what Dan said. I'd I'd stick that at a 70 to 75% on Rotten Tomatoes for sure. I don't think this is a groundbreaking movie by any stretch. And for I don't sure. think it's over here breaking new ground, but it's a fun movie. It's not too long because if it was too long, it would have dragged and that would have killed right. it. And I thought it was decently acted. I thought everyone played their roles well. And yeah, not, not much more. This to me is an example of a Friday night flick. You sit down with your mates and you grab some crisps and you, you know, shut up. You watch, you watch a horror movie. I agree with that. I mean, it, it didn't, like you said, it wasn't groundbreaking. There was nothing too deep about it. Maybe a little bit of, you know, masculinity, like we talked about earlier, masculinity issues and that topic. Though personally, I feel like it was a little too overdone in that sense, but it didn't. There, there's nothing groundbreaking about it, but it was just a good movie. Yeah. Agreed. So does this movie get the uh, don't open that door stamp of approval? For sure. I say so. I say so. All right. So there you have it, folks. This movie definitely gets the stamp of approval from your uh, friends here. Don't open that door. And any last thoughts, anyone, before we uh, send this one off into the sunset? Nah. I'm going to start carrying some silver. <laughs> well, I already do. So that's been it from us here at Don't Open That Door. Please go check out the movie How, support independent film as always. And last but not least, don't forget, please don't open that door. Have a great night, everyone. <laughs>